Thank you, Carolyn. And um, this is promising to be such a wonderful event, so many interesting uh, sessions, and we're really going to be um, thrilled, I think, to uh, open this uh, conference with uh, a talk from Professor Claire Hemmings. Uh, she's the uh, current director of the um, London School of Economics Gender Institute, um, and we're really delighted she's been able to come all the way around the world to join us for this event. She really is one of the most important contemporary thinkers of feminism as a movement, um, as a set of narratives, as a set of strategies, as a way of thinking. Um, her book uh, from 2011, Why Stories Matter, is a really brilliant engagement with the narratives that shape our understanding of feminism as a political project. And it very rightly won um, the Feminist and Women's Studies Association of UK and Ireland's Book Award um, in 2012. She's recently completed another monograph, Considering Emma Goldman, Feminist Politics of Ambivalence, which will be coming out with Duke University very shortly. And it's this project that we're going to hear from today. So please join me welcoming Claire. Uh, Emma Goldman uh, was an anarchist activist and thinker, uh, and she was a lifelong believer in anarchist revolution and the importance of prefigurative engagement with utopian ways of living that such re revolution would surely inaugurate. As an anarchist, activist, and theorist born in 1869 and who died in 1940, she spanned a very key period of both the rise and demise of particular social movements. Goldman was certain that sexual freedom was central to revolution and that unchosen authority of any kind was counter-revolutionary. She was clear that utopia is prefigurative, uh, and by that uh, she means living the future you want then, in the present now, and takes place in a never-ending struggle in preference to revolution. So I'm partly reminded of the opening remarks about the importance of ongoing everyday struggle. Um, yet for all her fervent certainties, Goldman's articulation of the means to bring about anarchist utopia was shot through with political ambivalence, about gender, race, and sexuality in particular. She was ambivalent about those very things that she cared about most, as most of us are. Women's oppression, anti-nationalism, sex itself. And that ambivalence has been seen as meaning, very often, that she fell short of her ideals while still remaining a heroic character. But my own view is that this is precisely the site of struggle and that it is her conflicting views on gender, race, and sexuality that are what we need to bring forward contemporarily in order to make sense of current dilemmas and power relations, or indeed to have a glimpse of utopia ourselves. I suggest that they offer a useful way of bringing forward past uncertainties as a way of illuminating present difficulties about precisely the same objects in queer feminist studies. That was just my, I've, I've bought too much technology because I kept changing the introduction, that's why I've got this. Now I'll move to paper. <laughs> it may initially come as a surprise for any of you that know uh, Emma Goldman, um, when I start from this proposition, that the Goldman archive is overflowing with ambivalence. This doesn't look like an ambivalent <laughs> character. After all, this is Emma Goldman, who is unequivocal about the central role that sexual politics and gendered division of labor and value play in the perpetuation of capitalist and militarist interests. Goldman spent her life foregrounding the inequalities attending and reinforcing women's subordinate role and insisted that women's position in the family was a fundamental feature of how capitalism worked rather than just its lamentable side effect, emphasizing the importance of the exploitation of women's reproductive labor as well as the impact of this tyranny on all women as individuals. It was, in fact, precisely because Goldman wanted to centre women's freedom as essential for revolution that she was so critical of suffrage and, the li and of the limits um, of efforts uh, to gain the vote. For Goldman, only women's fullest liberty would do what she describes as real emancipation. And she understood state-oriented recognition politics, such as the claiming of that vote, as a waste of revolutionary energy. 
In this, she was hardly alone, of course. Women's sexual and political freedom was consistently contrasted with the red herring of feminism or equality in a range of international anarchist movements, uh, and most particularly uh, those in Argentina and Chile. Goldman's rather frequent unpleasantness to women is harder to integrate into a celebration of her sexual politic, however. While most feminist thinking does include a critique of femininity and of some women in its representation and reproduction, in their representation and reproduction of the status quo, Goldman is understood to take her judgments too far. She can indeed be vitriolic towards women, representing them as uh, not only co-opted or oppressed, but specifically as stupid, vicious, petty, and corrupt. And probably more important, she takes great pleasure in her characterization of bourgeois consumers, uh, women as arch consumers, and of women in general as responsible for many of men's failings, in particular mothers. No surprise, I think, there. It is Goldman's enthusiastic antipathy towards femininity that signals her ambivalence about women's capacity to change, since it sutures these ills to women all the while she also rages about the importance of persuading them to change. But the, the, the conundrum here then is that if women are so uh, um, unoriented towards revolution and so supportive blindly of men and consuming of capitalism and so on, um, how it is that they will be able to generate uh, the character necessary in order to effect that change. Feminist critics tend to want to write off or ignore this ambivalence in order to claim Goldman as a feminist. Uh, and in fact, almost all feminist critics do eventually claim her as such. But in the process, they tend to see this simply as a mistake, her vitriol, where in fact, I would argue it's central to her argument about contemporary ills that need to be overcome as part of a revolutionary utopia. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that point in a bit. Uh, Goldman's ambivalence about femininity resonates in the feminist archive, albeit with the occasional false note, but her ambivalence about race and racism is harder for critics to negotiate. In relationship to racism and uh, race, feminists have noted with some dismay that Goldman, quote, misses race, um, that's a quote from Kathy Ferguson, claiming in her instead as an intersectional heroine before her time. So, and very often within feminist criticism on Goldman, you'll have uh, those two things in one sentence. What a shame she doesn't talk about race, but isn't she very intersectional indeed? Um, Goldman um, certainly was a practical and intuitive internationalist. She herself migrated and was exiled numerous times during her lifetime, and she had a trenchant critique of the relationship between nationalism, militarism, and capitalism, particularly in so far as these limited the possibilities for women to live full lives. She was thus a supporter of the Indian anti-colonial movement and the Mexican Revolution, and worked towards solidarity with anti-colonial str struggles in Africa and the Philippines. Goldman was, of course, one of those anarchist migrants who became politicized after her move from Russia to the United States, and who was first educated in and then exiled to Europe. She wrote to comrades uh, and intimates all over the world over her lifetime, no matter where she was living, and she participated in that vast network of transnational anarchist publication and translation that typified its vibrancy in the early 20th century. Goldman's border crossings and lack of belonging underwrite her challenges to patriotis uh, patriotism and capitalism, as well as the gendered and sexual norms that secure them. And those skeins of her life resonate well with a feminist critical and theoretical archive that foregrounds a transnational feminist politics attentive to contemporary geopolitical complexity. It's no surprise, in other words, that people like her. Yet Goldman, like many other European, Latin American, and American anarchists, was less clear on how to negotiate race politics. For Kathy Ferguson, one of her most brilliant interlocutors, Goldman's political commitments meant that she was, quote, confident that class would always trump race in the production of social inequality, 
unquote. And for Candice Falk, um, her biographer and archivist, while Goldman had a clear analysis of lynching as, quote, the most graphic and egregious expression of racist terrorism in the country, she did not theorize that horror as the focus of her general critique of state aggression. In other words, she recognized horrors, but she didn't theorize it independently as having a history that needed to be told. And she wasn't alone in, in, in that. Further, she draws on racist stereotypes in her depiction of life in prison in particular, in ways that are profoundly unpleasant and historically ignorant of colonialism, positioning black inmates as, as gaining special favors over uh, the Anglo inmates, as she terms it. She was not alone, of course. Anarchist social movements more generally, too, supported decolonial movements, but only in the move to general revolution and Western movements were white, if migrant. So of course anarchists supported uh, colonial, anti-colonial movements, but only as a move towards more general universal revolution, not in their own right. The critical response sees these issues, this uh, displacement or non-centering uh, of race politics and racism, uh, as self-evidently problematic. Uh, focusing, as I said, on how she misses race and negotiating a kind of embarrassment, a critical embarrassment at this missing in similar vein to anxiety about her anti-femininity. Yet this anxiety is itself productive of its own displacements, as anxiety usually is. Uh, in turning away from her partial theorizations of race because it's not deemed sufficient, a range of ways in which Goldman does explore how racism functions as a form of oppression are easily missed in turn. As indeed is her explicit framing of black movements as reformist as a critique, which they often were and often are. In wanting Goldman's attention to race to be familiar and appropriate, as well as privileged, the attention that she pays, in fact, to overlapping forms of violence and her analysis of the concept of slavery, she has a particularly strong analysis of slavery as both uh, or chosen or forced, and her analysis um, are glossed over. In other words, they receive almost no critical attention. For example, it is the differential response to similar forms of violence, anti-black violence scarcely being mentioned in the press or by social movements, for example, um, that she emphasized. In other words, the violence itself, might, she might have thought of as similar, but she was very clear about the different um, reception to particular forms of violence depending on the body. And that's quite interesting, uh, given then that she's highlighting and emphasizing an important aspect of racist history, that of representation, as well as questions of freedom from acts of actual violence. And again, this receives no, no mention because of a kind of critical embarrassment. And in terms of her critiques of nationalism or the mobilization of Jewish identity as what is thought of as an alternative, in framing her as an intersectional heroine before her time, despite this inattention to race and racism, the very ways in which those approaches combine in Goldman to provide a somewhat unexpected account of race and sexual freedom, or analysis of the relationship between anti-Semitism and anti-black violence, are also easily overlooked. In other words, in wanting intersectionality to displace or substitute for questions of um, anti-black violence, uh, she miss, uh, the critical material tends to miss the ways in which she tries to articulate them together. I've been particularly struck by her critique of race as embedded in the family, for example, such that she sees the expansion of kinship through sexual freedom as, as a prefiguration of an anti- or post-race cosmopolitanism central to anarchist utopia, despite no attention to this particular way in in the critical archive. So she centers sexual freedom not only as a challenge to militarism and capitalism, but as a challenge to racist nationalisms. Um, <clears throat> for Goldman, sexual politics is a method both of women's liberation in anti-capitalist endeavor, but it's also part of how narrow race-based nationalisms are potentially transformed. And in thinking about it as method, one of the things I do in the broader book is think about how to, um, how to um, reimagine the relationship between sexual and race politics. And what of sexual freedom in, in what of sexual freedom indeed? Surely Goldman, as the great sexual political icon uh, of that period, uh, could not be thought of as ambivalent here. 
Goldman was among those early 20th century anarchists and socialists who understood sexual expression to be a basic human right. Uh, she, that's her term. It's one of the few times she uses the term. The, t uh, the few times she uses the term "human right." It's not uh, a favourite. <laughs> Basic human right, a legitimate goal of the class struggle. So here, it's interesting. An inversion. Instead of uh, sexual freedom being um, a goal of the class, um, instead of uh, sexual freedom coming afterwards, it's a legitimate goal. The method of which might be uh, class struggle. Goldman theorizes the sexual division of labor not simply as a prior condition for production and thus capitalist exploitation, but as labor alienated and exploited as is other labor in capitalism, and thus an integral part of economic production. That won't surprise any of you, I'm sure there's plenty of Marxist feminists in the room. Uh, through this analysis, Goldman links birth control issues, prostitution and wholesale destruction of the poor in wartime, and develops her strong arguments for love as the site of reclaimed value, privileged site of reclaimed value, creativity and progressive possibility, when returned into the hands of its workers, women. Goldman not only theorized sexual freedom, but also practiced it through her lifetime, refusing to be domestically tied to men or children, and struggling with the contradictions between feelings and politics that structure her bravery in this respect. The feminist critical archive on Goldman's understanding of sexual freedom is, of course, seduced by that centering of sexual politics as both means and end of utopia, and by Goldman's linking of nationalism, militarism, and control of women's bodies. Her support for and theorization of prostitution as an effect of capitalism, migration, and repressed sex drives have pleased queer theorists too, less on the repressed sex drive front, but more on the migration and capitalism front, as has her contradictory support for homosexual liberty. Very contradictory. But so too, that archive finds limits to this privileging of sexual freedom, representing it as too vague on the one hand and excessively, too excessively focused on men on the other, particularly following discovery of her self-abasing letters to her tour manager um, and um, long-term lover, Ben Reitman. Uh, but a range of different thinkers also celebrate Goldman's bold relationship to relationship to sexual freedom in her life and work, also remaining dubious about her claiming of sexuality as the core of human nature, whatever its object choice. Bonnie Harland goes furthest in this line of thinking, framing Goldman as a heterosexual essentialist because of her support for sexological and psychoanalytic understandings of sexuality, as well as her excess of passion for Reitman, combined with her uncertain relationship to homosexuality. It's important, I think, to consider the ways in which Goldman is interrogating the question of sexuality's relationship to capitalism and freedom at a point in history when sexuality as an identity is in the process of being articulated. Goldman is forging her own theory of sexual freedom as a difficult and contested, rather than self-evident, position of critique or transformation. In addition, Goldman's complex engagement with sexual politics in theory and practice poses an important challenge to assumptions about the nature of sexual identity and freedom in the present. In relationship to prostitution, for example, Goldman's support for sex workers themselves stems from her support for all women to free themselves from social constraint. Her argument is that prostitution is no less egregious than other forms of social of sexual institutionalization. It, along with marriage, would disappear in a free society, leaving women free to express currently constrained desire. And in that sense, I think it, it offers a slightly different intervention into contemporary debates about prostitution and sex work, uh, which either tend to be focused on abolition or on labor support uh, for sex work. For Goldman, uh, thinking about uh, prostitution as one of a variety of kinds of oppression of uh, women that real sexual liberation um, would um, uh, cease to make necessary is a particular intervention that tends to uh, also um, be ignored, partly because it relies on assumptions about um, sexual interiority and drives um, that are perhaps a little bit less popular. And in relationship to homosexuality, uh, about which she is indeed very ambivalent, 
Um, her, this ambivalence also means that questions of rights-based sexual politics are displaced by her refusal of single-issue politics uh, and also by that own, uh, her own uncertainty about her and others' desire and how to interpret it. So that gives you, I hope, a little sense of the different debates she has around questions of gender, uh, race, and uh, sexuality, and of course they overlap. And I'm going to turn now, uh, in the second part, to thinking about methodology. Hopefully in a little bit more exciting ways than that sounds. <laughs> um, so if we think Goldman is ambivalent about categories that we hold dear and that we would like to perhaps be a little less ambivalent, how do we think about those threads of ambivalence and bring them forward in ways that enliven present utopian aims? In the book that I've just finished, the focus is on methodology. Uh, and in particular, I've singled out three uh, issues to flag for you this morning. Um, <clears throat> affect, imagination, and style. All of these three center the intersubjective aspects of the engagement with a figure such as Goldman and explore the question of temporality and relationality as central to utopian imagination. I'm just going to indicate rather than fully explore these uh, because of, of time, but hope that you'll be able to ask me questions about them or uh, come and talk to me about them at another point. Um, so first, affective method. In affective terms, reading and thinking with Goldman has forced uh, me to sit with the struggle over meanings of gender, race, and sexuality rather than resolve them and ride out, to some extent, the discomfort that requires. Uh, because, of course, these questions of vitriol, um, race stereotyping, and sexual nature are not necessarily positions I share or feel comfortable with. What slips out of my grasp uh, what slips out of my grasp or is easily framed as someone else's bad habit when I don't find what I want in the Goldman archive. In methodological terms, it's my own affective responses to reading Goldman that have opened up for me what I might know but tend to deny in relationship to Goldman. For example, I laughed uproariously at Goldman's viciousness to women when I first encountered it in her writing, um, sharing nasty laughter at, at women's manipulability and culpability for their own oppression, clearly distancing myself from that manipulability uh, as I did so. I've come to think of that pleasure, my laughing, as a way of letting my partner in crime Goldman carry the burden of our shared judgment of femininity <clears throat> and somehow displacing me from femininity even at the same time as I uh, share in that laughter. My laughing, my pleasure, lets me off the hook even as it binds me to Goldman in a kind of culpable uh, relationship. <clears throat> Similarly, my initial response to Goldman's understanding of race and racism in her work was highly effective. I shared the critical disappointment and her lack of sustained theorizing of race politics and found a firmer footing, as I suspect we all do, in reframing her initially as a prophetic intersectional thinker. In other words, it's not simply critics who do this uh, as if critics were not me. Yet something niggled at me, made me ashamed at my own displacement of race politics that seemed to mirror hers, even as I sought to distance myself from her in this regard. And finally, I wrestled for some time with my, what I can only describe as bodily glow, at Goldman's sexual politics, my pleasure in her fervency and in her declarative way of, of, of promoting this, her insistence on human capacity as generous rather than mean-spirited, trying to control that common joy by filtering her through a more sophisticated contemporary post-structuralist critical post-anarchist sieve. In doing so, I missed for a long time the important temporality of Goldman's belief in human nature, a future orientation I was only able to glimpse when I gave in to that glow. That idea of nature as not fully encountered now, but as prefigurative, living it now in order that it should become. Much as one might apologize for a well-meaning but embarrassing relative in ways one later feels as a reciprocal humiliation, my own attempts to clean up Goldman could not be sustained. 
She kept jabbing at my ribs and stomach, and in each case brought me back to her ambivalence as considerably more engaging than my own superficial certainties. Starting from affect, uh, shed some light on ambivalence through what it is that jars or can't be carried easily forward, and what that says about my own and other feminist certainties, rather than somehow what that tells us uh, about a full account of Goldman, who of course is always outside of, of my or anybody's interpretation. Um, in that sense, then, affect, or these small moments of affect, uh, gave me a sense both of what it is that I might want from Goldman, and also in that sense, then, what it is that a contemporary uh, politics might be preoccupied with that makes some things harder to say than others. And my sense, then, is that as a method, that sense of affect is a kind of moment, uh, not of truth, but of an interruption or a particular kind of... Um, light on mm, different forms of epistemic value can be very helpful. Um, so secondly, in terms of method, my concern with ambivalence has also become a way of enlivening, I hope, <laughs> the back and forth of queer feminist historiography. My reading for ambivalence forces me into a relationship with Goldman that doesn't seek only to reproduce her in my own image or to imagine her simply dead. Um, because clearly, in many ways, she isn't. It opens up the question of how we read the past as one of care as well as desire, and assumes that the archive is only ever partial and that the gaps cannot be straightforwardly filled. Thus, how do we represent anarchism as a lost cause that was once so vibrant without reproducing that erasure? How do we talk about sexual politics as central to challenging racism, as this is a hard to track and not so popular thread? And how to think with and through non-identitarian sexual freedom in an era of rights claims as the dominant mode of redress contra heteronormativity? So in the spirit of both ambivalent history and love for Goldman, I have also turned to fiction and creative labor. Um, if we want evidence of solidarity in the face of annihilation without rewriting or fetishizing the past, then we will have to imagine what we will never be able to verify. Utopia is not archived in its struggling, failing forms. So I'll briefly introduce you to an experiment that I've undertaken with letters to and from Goldman. As indicated, Goldman was ambivalent over homosexuality. She was cutting as well as supportive, in particular about gay men. She was coy about sex between women and between men in ways that seem very unlike her. And yet, we also have more than 65 extremely long, thank you, hilarious, <clears throat> provocative, over the top, deeply disturbing, and often sexually explicit letters to Goldman from Almeda Sperry in 1912 and 1913 and which, importantly, to which we have no replies. Sperry was a labor union and anarchist activist living in a small town, in small town East Coast America. A woman who sometimes had sex for money was married to her sometimes pimp Fred, with whom she had a violent relationship. She was an alcoholic, chain-smoking literary fantasist whose letters, fabulous letters, may I say, detail her beguiling attempts to seduce Goldman uh, there's a whole series of them that tell uh, Goldman how good sex will be uh, if only she will come to New York so that they can have it. It's a brilliant seduction tactic, right? Her delight in what was clearly the consummation of their desire, her obsessive whining once it appears the mutual att attraction had dimmed, and the manic turn to barely contain violence that predictably marks the end of many a relationship. It is tempting indeed to want to fill these gaps, to find additional sources and to write a counter history that displays alternative ed evidence for the skeptic. And believe me, nothing would delight me more than discovering Goldman's replies to Sperry in all their smutty glory, much like uh, Candace Falk found the letters to Reitman in all their self-abasement. But what if, instead of a search for lost sources, we read these gaps creatively and productively as a central aspect of sexual history, both then and now, starting from there, but not leaving them stranded as part of what constitutes a utopian methodology? 
As post-colonial theorists and fiction writers have shown so powerfully, stories can and must be retold from the position of these gaps and fissures. Not to provide an authentic alternative, but to, quote, strain against the archive, uh, that's Saidiya Hartman, in order to be able to imagine what cannot be verified. Uh, so although there's something very appealing about tracking my hopes for alternative sexual histories uh, through the brilliant violent letters that form one side of the correspondence between this labour unionist, sex worker and married woman, and this anarchist and free love advocate, I'm not prepared to read Goldman only through the traces and echoes that ultimately take me back into that lack. In a creative letter writing project of my own, I write back to Sperry the letters I imagine Goldman writing when I read the ones we have. And in doing so, I foreground our collect both our collective failure to find them, as well as the importance of still imagining them there. Starting from my yearning for Sperry's and Goldman's correspondence in all its complexity, allows me to centre Goldman's struggles within sexual freedom as part of a history of revolutionary thinking and being, in which love and lust are dynamic forces that cut through and across history. Politics, sorry. Across politics. The aim is to bring life to an imagined sexual history in which Goldman's own sexual confidence and ambivalence, opposite and same-sex passion and disgust, fear and bravery must have crafted the words she wrapped around Sperry's heart. And lastly, um, panache, style and politics. Candace Falk responds to decades of typifying Goldman's life and work as dominated by passion by characterising them instead and in passing as filled with what she calls panache. I found this thread of possibility very provocative and productive precisely because it issues a focus on intention. Was Goldman really a feminist? Should she have done more in this and that respect? Which tend to be very particular critical questions. It issues that focus on intention in favour of style. What style? The term panache derives from Edmund Rostand Serrano de Bergerac, the heroic big-nosed figure who does all for a love he cannot have. The original text itself, the Rostand's text, suggests there are four primary aspects of panache, not believing in worldly value and reward, love as the basis of transcendence, self-styling and insatiability in relationship to the world, and the art of the losing battle. Goldman has all these aspects too, and I read her of, as a hero of similar mythic and flawed majesty. Um, one minute, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Important too, this is a way of framing Goldman not as a figure of feminist or queer identification, requiring that we resolve ambivalence. This is a figure we wonder at and use that wonder as a stepping stone or catalyst for our own abilities to imagine a different future. Panache, in other words, um, gives us an inkling into awe as a mode of imagination rather than identification, which is uh, a flatter um, relationship, it seems to me. Indeed, it is precisely the carrying of flaws and contradictions, and not their resolution, that is the hallmark of panache as part of living utopia in the present. In essence, we might say that panache allows a range of incommensurable positions to be held intention precisely because of the life force of its subject, the power for Goldman of the minority or individual over what she sees as the self-reproductive majority. While passion as a mode of politics offers the possibility of overcoming worldly obstacles, panache describes the courageous way that certain unusual individuals can embrace a losing battle, carry themselves with style, and challenge limits to human endeavour and creativity wherever they find them. Goldman takes on anarchism as a living force in the affairs of our life, embracing the struggle to live as an anarchist, although knowing this cannot succeed, while there is not yet anarchy with a capital A, uh, and indeed there still is not. Her foolish, brave actions cannot and do not change the circumstances under which she operates, or we operate. Anarchism is, after all, the great failed social movement of the last 150 years. And romantic heroes who sacrifice all for love and honour live on primarily in our memories and imaginations. Yet the embodied hope and possibility represented by Goldman pulses with life, 
The panache with which she takes up their various causes, hat always at a jaunty angle, inspires a kind of awe, perhaps, an awe that is surely necessary to imagine ourselves other than we already are. Thank you.